All right, we are here to talk about the running backs that you should not be drafting this year. I mean, I may be a little too scared to tell you uh, seven names. So we have seven fantasy experts brought from all over the world to give you that exact information. First guy coming from Indianapolis. My guy, thank you for making it. We have Avery from Domain Fantasy Football. Who are we not taking, my guy? So when in doubt in fantasy football drafts, one rule that I like to live by that I actually have crocheted on a pillow is don't draft bad running backs in bad offenses, right? And so I'm going to take a running back from a bad offense. I'm going to choose Najee Harris. And Najee Harris, you look at every year that he's been in the league. Look at his attempts. Look at his targets. Look at his fantasy production. It is a downward trajectory. And we talk about we talk about guys, you know, that are on upward trajectories and um, how you want to maybe take advantage of those guys while they're on the upswing of their career from a production standpoint. Najee is literally the exact opposite of that. He's a guy that when you're looking at his rookie year was really productive, got a ton of targets. You had really high hopes for him. Everybody thought that he was maybe going to be a very relevant fantasy assets for a really long time. And now with Najee Harris, you've seen that steady decline and the Situation in Pittsburgh, I think a lot of people would argue is going to get better. You've got Arthur Smith coming from Atlanta. You think, okay, maybe he's going to give Najee and Jalen Warren both a pretty heavy workload. I would argue that I don't want any piece of that offense no matter what. I think that Jalen Warren is more likely to be the fantasy production guy there. And I also think he's more likely to hit on his price. And Najee's price is not bad. But with that being said, I think if you're in on Jalen Warren this year, you should probably be out on Najee Harris and vice versa. So for me, if I'm going to take a piece of that Steelers offense from the running back position, I'll take Jalen Warren. Um, if you again, if you're going to be in on Najee Harris, I think you have to be in on Jalen. I don't really, I don't have a super strong preference one way or another, but I'm really not taking a lot of either of them. And Najee is the guy that I'm taking absolutely none of this year. Bad offense, so yeah, for sure. And if you looked at like best ball drafts before the Jalen Warren injury, they were essentially going back to back picks. Yeah. But if you look at your home leagues and the uh, ESPN ADP, the Yahoo ADP, NFL Fantasy, you actually have a pretty large gap between the two where Najee is still being drafted as if he's the full-blown starter, but he has declined every year over the past three. Jalen Warren over the past two years from a per-touch perspective has been significantly more efficient than Najee Harris. And it's a bad offense, as you already mentioned. And I think it's funny that we go, oh, okay, um, Arthur Smith is out of Atlanta. That means B. John Robinson's going to crush oh, Arthur Smith is in Pittsburgh. Maybe that means Najee. It's like, I don't know how it could be. Both. It's, it's how, you know it's I mean? how it fits everybody's own agenda. And, yeah. and again, with Najee, like, I, I do think that, I think there was a time where everybody thought he was going to be fantasy productive. But from a price standpoint, when you're drafting them back to back, you're essentially, if you're taking one of them, you're just betting that that one's going to be the guy, right? You've essentially got a, what, you know what, a 50-50 shot that you're picking yeah. the right running back. And I would rather just take somebody that I think is has a better shot of being like a clear workhorse somebody like and even the Bengals offense like I'd rather just take one of Moss or Chase Brown because it's a much better offense I feel a little bit better I have a little bit more conviction with that and I know that if one is going to be productive the other one at least has a chance of being somewhat productive as well where with the Steelers I don't want that offense so all right we have Zach from Fantasyland down under uh, uh, making a 25 hour flight ish to Austin Texas to tell you not to who to draft at running back okay well this is going to get the most hate on this video I'm going to talk about Kyron Williams, but I just want you guys to take a breath, all right, because I know there will be a lot of hate. Just let me explain. I'm not saying don't draft Kyron Williams. I know we don't like handcuffs, but he, to me, is a player you absolutely have to handcuff. So in the sense of, like, if you are going to draft him, make sure that you handcuff him, and here's the reasons why. I mean, we haven't seen Kyron Williams. He's only been in the NFL two years. We haven't seen him stay healthy a, a single year. If you look at 2022, broken foot and OTAs, high ankle sprain in week one. If you look at 2023, hip injury in week four, high ankle sprain in week six, broke his hand in the playoff versus Detroit. In the first two years, he's missed 12 out of 34 games. That's 35% of his games. Injury Sharks database, they give him an 88.7% chance of injury, which is the fourth highest mark in their database. And they project him to miss about 3.48 games, which is the most for any running back in the NFL this year. So I'm not telling you not to draft Kyron. I'm saying this is, I know we don't like handcuffs. Limit your upside. This nonsense. Like Kyron could genuinely like be out week one. It would not surprise me at all. I'm not projecting that. But I think you have to get Blake Corum as well because whoever it is at running back, they're going to smash. We just don't know if Kyron can stay healthy. There's no evidence that, he's, that he can. Last thing I'll say is Sean McVay hasn't had a, back-to-back -back rusher over a thousand yards since 2017 2018 it's been a revolving door there and this is an offense you want to be a part of obviously with Sean McVay but you just I think you need the safety like again you're going to limit your upside but you know you're going to get a running back regardless 
that's going to be the starter for this team, a team that has had a top two points per game score two out of the last seven years, a top 21 points per game score in five of the last seven years, secure it. I get it. Like you want upside everywhere, but you need security for Kyron Williams specifically. Couple what ifs. You're on the board at the end of the second tomorrow in the flock draft. Are you going Kyron or Derrick Henry? Kyron. But I am then going to like a round early secure Blake Corum. Does that make so like if he's going 10th round, I'm like ninth round, I'm, I'm taking Corum. Now you all will know that. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now I know to take him, yeah. trade him to you. Exactly. Okay. Kyron or Pacheco? Oh, uh, so you yeah. got the Chiefs hat. I, I am Kyron, unfortunately, okay. on that one. Kyron HN. Kyron pretty easily for me. Sounds like you're drafting Kyron, my guy. I know. Sounds like this is not a no, can't avoid I, Kyron. Sounds like you must that's draft That's what I'm saying. Coral. I'm saying it's not so much a must draft. It's more of a you have to handcuff this player. And by the way, if you're take here's the thing. If you take Kyron and you don't get Blake Corum, I, I honestly think you've made the wrong decision. That's where I'm coming from, right? So it's just, you just have to lock up Blake Corum in this offense. Otherwise, you should have taken Pacheco right? You should have taken these other names. Guys who have been healthier throughout their career have been able to handle that workload. Kyron's a, a back, Derrick Henry's 230 pounds or whatever it is, right? Pacheco's 215 or something. So we just, there's no evidence so far Kyron Williams can handle that workload on an entire year. But Docky was also on that 25 hour flight from Australia over at Fantasyland. Who are we going with my guy? Devon the Chain. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I think you're pretty high on him. I could be wrong, but for me, I am I'm avoiding him right now. In the end of the second round, look, understand the efficiency, what we saw last year, 7.8 yards per carry. I mean, he was incredible if you got him in the late rounds. C completely understand. But I think the price is a little bit better on Raheem Mostert right now, especially what he did. He's the top, if I'm not mistaken, top five running back this past year. And he's still there. <laughs> he hasn't gone away. I've, If I was, you know, I was preaching all offseason. Okay, if Raheem is no longer on this team, I completely understand the pathway of why you should be taking Devon in the late second. But for me, that is just way too early. I would, I personally would rather take Nico Collins, uh, Debo Samuel. Um, I would rather even wait, wait a couple rounds, get Josh Jacobs, right? I mean, I just think the risk is too high, but I understand the reward as well. I think that's why everyone is taking Devon so early. But look, we haven't seen a running back his size be a one a number one running back two going to repeat we're all expecting the expectation is for him to repeat the efficiency i just i think it's a little bit risky for me i'm right there with you so i i am not bold enough i'm not i'm not brave enough okay to say it okay so i i am like sitting here with hn going if you're on espn get him late round three 100 percent. like yeah. the uh, the upside's worth it but where you're seeing people push him up to now He's going in some drafts like back to back with Saquon Barkley, where he looks like an extreme outlier on paper, where he was the most efficient running back in the NFL last year. Yep. We know efficiency is the most volatile thing from your to your perspective. As you already mentioned, we've never seen a running back at his size handle a large workload. The only running backs we've seen at his size be top options in fantasy are guys like Darren Sproles and Tariq Cohen that are just going to catch the ball out of the backfield. Exactly. And it's not like HN had a massive receiving role last year. So with HN, I think you're either betting on one of two outlier outcomes. You're betting on one for a running back to maintain the best efficiency we've ever seen in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Or two, for a smaller running back to have a larger workload than we've ever seen from a running back under, I think he weighs 188 pounds or did at the combine. We've yeah. never seen a running back that weighed that little at the combine be able to handle 20 plus touches a game. And they add in Jalen Wright. So that's the other thing. Yeah. I, we haven't even touched on Jalen Wright. That was my next point. It was like, okay, what's the expectation with Jalen Wright? They spent a decent draft capital on him. Raheem's older. I'm not saying Devon is injury prone, but he did struggle with injuries this past year. He's an undersized running back. I guess the chances and the expectations, not, not expectations, but the chance of him getting re-injured for his size historically seems higher from what we know. So I, I don't know. I'm just, I think all these guys can have a, you know, a piece of the pie. It just depends on who is going to finish higher at the end of the day. And I don't think it's going to be Devon. Now, if you're going to draft HN, I definitely recommend you doing it in your home league where you can get up at the end of the third. But specifically, 
in underdog drafts where I'm drafting every single night on the live stream. They are, I think you can't take them at the beginning of the second. But yeah, if you want to draft with me in a draft, we're streaming every single night on underdog. Their best ball, so no time commitment at all during the year. So I draft hundreds of teams every year. It's high 150,000 on underdog two years ago. And of course, if you want to join that draft, you can find the link in the description, in the comment section. If you use code FLOCK, you're going to get a 50% deposit bonus up to $250. You're going to get my 2024 fantasy football rankings, my 2024 fantasy football draft guide, plus a 2024 ADP consensus cheat sheet to help you out in your draft. And a Christian McCaffrey special pick them more than less than half a total yard for week one. All right, we have Nathan from Domain Fantasy Football. Thank you for coming down, my guy. And who should we not draft? Yeah, I I honestly don't know why. Well, I do know why. Joe Mixon rubs me the wrong way going right now in the third, fourth rounds. And, and to me, for him, he just... He, his situation last year was really great where he should have gotten a significant amount of volume like he did. But he didn't really turn it on until the touchdowns came, right? And I, I know the touchdowns and the touchdown dependence is kind of a, a weak argument for Joe Mixon, me being low on him this year, but that's not the only reason for me. I actually am not a huge fan of the situation change from Cincinnati to Houston. I mean, we've we've spent literally the entire offseason, everyone in the fantasy community has spent the entire offseason trying to figure out who's going to get the ball in the passing game between Diggs, between Nico, and between tank Dell. And the, the whole reason we've had this discussion is because we know exactly what they're going to do. And that is consistently and constantly pass the ball. And yes, I know we've seen Mixon be productive in a pass happy offense in Cincinnati before, but to me, I think it's a different situation where you saw Singletary last year kind of be serviceable and, and be, he had a safe enough floor. Um, but with Mixon, he's a guy that's on the wrong side of 27 and he is really I, between the career touches that he's had and the fact that on film last year he lost a step like he really was entirely dependent on the touchdowns that he was or wasn't getting in the red zone and it just scares me this year i, I am not very excited about taking him as high as he's going right now yeah my thing with Mixon is i think the encouraging argument is you will have more trips to the red zone so you will potentially have more touchdown opportunities I think if he would have potentially stayed in Cincinnati and Burrow was fully healthy, it would have been a much better situation than Houston. Uh, compared to last year, though, where you have absolutely nobody at quarterback in Cincy, I, I do think that the Texans are an improvement here. Are you worried about another running back potentially having a role, or do you at least see Mixon as a three-down player? I expect Mixon to get most, if not all, of the opportunity there. I don't think Damian Pierce is really going to eat into his workload that much because he couldn't eat into Singletary's workload last year. Um, it really is. This is it's it's why I am well aware that this is a pretty unpopular take with Mixon. But I think there's too many variables to already be considering in that offense for me to be really excited about taking him at price because I just don't think he's going to be a league winner and in that range when you're going for upside if you're going for safety in the first couple of rounds which Zach from Fantasyland has referenced um, in, in previous videos like it's I, you want to go for upside in the later rounds and to me Mixon is just another guy that you're kind of taking your medicine you're like okay maybe he'll be a low-end running back one he's not gonna be any better than that so I, I just think there are more exciting picks there all right Corey famously has never drafted a running back so I mean I'm sure they're all voids but we have Bush from Fantasy Stock Exchange made his way down from Canada to give you this running back. Yeah, and this one's a little bit of a cop-out because I feel like people are probably getting a little bit lower on him as of late due to the J.J. McCarthy injury. I'm not the biggest fan of Aaron Jones. And I think part of the reason, because I'm sure a lot of you guys listening to this play in home leagues, Aaron Jones has been very fantasy relevant for a number of years. People feel comfortable. He's a comfy click for a lot of people. They're going to feel comfortable drafting him in the fourth round, in the fifth round, where he's kind of a peak dead zone back at that price tag. And the reason I say that is because you look at Aaron Jones. He's like 30 years old. Struggled to stay healthy the last couple of years, particularly last year. All it takes is like one nagging injury for this guy to just have a completely wiped out season, just like we saw from him last season. He's been good when he's been on the field, but that's been in the Green Bay offense. Jordan Love was a great quarterback last year. They were a great offense breakout unit. With the Vikings, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of faith in Sam Darnold. I have faith in the coaching staff, but the quarterback play really kind of concerns me there. And also, I mean, Ty Chandler will probably be involved to some degree. I don't think that Aaron Jones is going to suddenly become a workhorse after seven, eight years of never being one um, with the Green Bay Packers. So I look at a guy who's got some nice upside. He's got a good case on a week over week basis, but over the course of a full season, I feel like that's a regrettable draft pick. I would much rather draft 
wide receiver talent in that area of the board. I would much rather draft an elite tight end or an elite quarterback. It's more so a, a philosophy thing for me to not have to draft running backs like Aaron Jones because if I want an anchor or two, I get them early as opposed to waiting till the fourth, fifth round where a lot of people's league mates will be reaching for a guy like Aaron Jones because they don't have enough running back talent at this point. Yeah, and the thing is too, what's like the real upside of Aaron Jones if you were to take him? It's probably going to be a bad offense, quarterback Sam Darnold's. At the same time, he's maybe the third option in said bad offense. The Packers decided, okay, this is a fan favorite player. He's washed. Let's let him go. And, and ultimately, yes, he was in the same class as some of these guys like CMC and Joe Mixon, but he's actually a little bit older than those other running backs. I mean, in, from that same class, you already have guys washed out of the NFL like Dalvin Cook and Leonard Fournette. You know, so I think that, honestly, Aaron Jones is a lot closer to like the Leonard Fournette, Dalvin Cook type running back now than he is to Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, I mean, he'll be 30 this year. Like, yeah. and from a talent standpoint, Jones was good. So, like, don't get me wrong here. I don't think he's, like, necessarily a bad player. I just, the, the factors start to pile up when the upside is not a stud running back and a great offense. The upside is maybe he's a good running back, too, because he's on, he's getting volume, like, and he's still a good enough player to kind of um, get some work done. But the fact that he's not with Green Bay anymore and he's in an offense that just lost at least the only piece of upside that we could have said about their quarterback play, which was the rookie quarterback they drafted, I just, I don't feel good about that. And for me, the way I leverage that is I take Ty Chandler later on. And it's not that I think Ty Chandler's a world beater necessarily. I just think if I want a piece of that backfield, I'm going to play it through the cheaper option with Chandler. Bandana's on. That means we have Danny here from FSE, made it down from Canada. Who are we avoiding, my guy? Yeah, it's uh, funny that Corey mentioned a running back from the 2017 class because I'm sticking to that theme. We are fading Alvin Kamara of the New Orleans Saints, and it feels kind of weird that I'm on an island here. Now, obviously, of course, in your home league markets, he'll go higher than, like, underdog. An underdog, if you're getting him in, like, the seventh round, eighth round, whatever, that's fine there. But in home leagues, where he's going in round four and round five, heck to the no. When it comes with Alvin Kamara, we're talking about a running back that just came off his worst efficiency season of his career, sub 3.9 yards per carry, sub 5.5 yards per target. And when we're talking about the offensive situation here, what do we really have to look forward to? Now, obviously, of course, last season with Kamara was a workhorse running back. 286 opportunities, obviously ample opportunity in the receiving game. Finished very high, but the issues that I have is when a running back shows this level of efficiency drop-off, typically expecting them to continue going forward isn't necessarily the case to be. Now, obviously, he's going off now as a mid-range RB2, and with Alvin Kamara, he's playing in a potential bottom five offense with the Saints, an offense that really we have not much to look forward to overall. And Kamara himself, going into year eight, where historically running backs actually only produce 73% of their average career production, I'm very concerned. Now, the upside here is what I'm concerned with because I think very well, given the opportunity, given the overall volume you should receive, you probably got a low-end RB2 projection, but can he really finish as a top 12 running back yet again, given the offensive situation, given the overall talent level at this point in his career? That's where I have struggles. Not to mention, we saw in 2023, he only handled 40% of the Saints inside the five touches. This is a guy in Alvin Kamara. I mean, everybody remembers the December, you know, Christmas game that won them their championships, what, back in 2021, I believe, where he scored six touchdowns. But he only saw 40% of the inside the five carries for the Saints this past year. Taysom Hill is obviously going to be involved. And although we've heard, heard pessimism this offseason thus far with guys like Kendrick Miller in the backfield, at the same time, betting on the year two running back to potentially usurp him, not in the depth chart, but more so in terms of the opportunity share, I do think could be a case. Now, am I saying Alvin Kamara is going to lose touches overall to Kendra? Not necessarily, but if it's more of a 70-30, 65-35 type of situation, I'm really concerned that the efficiency won't be there for him to overcome the lack of volume comparative to last year. Yeah, I, I just think my thing with Kamara is you probably have the lack of overall touchdown upside, yep. which may not matter as much in a full PPR format because in a full PPR format, he can just get there with the reception volume. But if you're playing in a non-PPR league or even a half PPR league where you're a little more inclined to lean on touchdowns, then yeah, I think he does have a cap ceiling in an offense that is probably not going to make it to the red zone very often. No, I agreed. And not to mention, like you said, with the receiving game, yes, he could get there in that aspect. But at the same time, this isn't your 2020 Alvin Kamara where he was arguably the best receiving back in the league. Like he was genuinely inefficient on his receiving volume last year. And if he continues being inefficient on that volume, what if we see Chris Olave take a step up? What if we see, you know, Rashid Shahid out of the backfield step up? Not to mention, not, Derek Carr is not the type of passer as a quarterback that can legitimately flirt with 30-plus passing touchdowns, 4,500-plus passing yards to insulate that situation. So with Kamara, again, he's got a narrow range of outcomes if he is healthy. 
to finish as a low end RB2 to possibly a mid end RB2. But when I'm drafting a running back in round four, round five, I need them to have top 12 outside, and I simply don't see that being the case with Kamara this year. Hopefully, we were able to help you out. And of course, over on flockfantasy.com, you can find everybody's rankings that were featured in this video, plus multiple draft guides, trade calculator, the whole nine yards. If you use code FLOCK, you're going to get 30% off any sub, and yours truly will break down your fantasy football team after you draft it. If you go with the Mother Flocker annual tier, just submit it through the site.